I've decided to do a book now because it was almost exactly 50 years ago that I graduated and I didn't really know what to expect of life and I thought that as I got older life would get easier, I'd be more experienced, I would know more. But what I've actually found is that everything's changing so fast and technology is changing so fast that we're all learning all the time and I really do believe that young people have the will and the ingenuity to solve today's and tomorrow's problems. James's ambition was to make enough money to pay for the next one. But look what's happened. The speed at which things are able to happen. It's mind-blowing. It's an exciting company. It keeps you on your toes. It's extraordinary. This happens. It's insane. Well, now, I was at the Royal College of Art but I realised that actually how something works and the technology inside it is just as interesting, if not more interesting, than the design. And I happened to meet Jeremy Fry, who owned an engineering company. I showed him a design I had done, and he said, well, that's very nice, but I'm not going to give you any money for it, but I would like you to design a high-speed lending craft for me, about which I knew nothing. So I had to learn on the job in a hurry. It was the first thing I'd ever made. I wasn't a businessman, but I approached it with enthusiasm and learned quickly from other people, made lots of mistakes. And then he thought, oh, I've had this idea for this mad ball barrow. I think I'll leave now. When people first saw the ball barrow, uh, they thought it was outrageous. But the thing it did teach me, if you have a better idea and engineer it well, people will want it, even though it's three times the price. After the ball barrow, there were a number of things that Dad was looking at in terms of products. It ranged from a potato peeler to an amphibious vehicle. Also a wheelchair, very much proving out the principle and the viability of the engineering. And then the vacuum cleaner was the last one. I don't remember to him doing much vacuum yes. cleaner. <laughs> but could I imagine myself being a vacuum cleaner manufacturer? <laughs> you know, could I possibly take on all these huge giants like Electrolux and Hoover and Miele and so on? Just in the back of my head, and a bit in my heart, I suppose, I thought I'd done something important. You don't know then, well, you've got absolutely no idea whether it's going to be commercially successful, whether it's going to work even, whether you're going to be able to make it, how you're going to make it. It's fragile. It can just blow away. That all we'd hear was it's sort of banging and crashing and soaring, and and there were honestly every day there was a development and then a failure and a development and a failure. I'd be able to do about one test like that a day, and I'd go in the next day and make a different cyclone and do another set of tests. Day after day, month after month, as it turned out, year after year. Apart from that, we had a normal family life. <laughs> he was on his own for quite a long time before he started getting the old person in to help him. Life in the coach house at that time was probably quite similar to a lot of small businesses. First book, September 89. And it was sort of quite a magical place back then, you know. Everybody was very busy, everybody knew exactly what they were doing. There was great esprit de corps draw up designs, get a prototype made downstairs in the workshop. So if you phone up downstairs, they say, engine room. Maybe at the end of the day, we'd go down and sort of help out. And we hadn't got a salesman, we hadn't got a production manager. We had none of the structure and organisation that you have when you set about manufacturing something. We were merely a group of engineers developing a product at this stage. And then I can remember the day when we actually made 100 machines and that was sort of like a big sort of threshold to to get to. You know, a small team of two or three people had achieved a full-on production line. It was incredible. Yeah, the speed with which it all changed. In the third year of college, from everyone talking about Philip Stark, Ross Lovegove, Richard Sapper, you know, Alessi, to everyone talking about that in lectures in the third year. This is the designer of the future. This is a, a businessman and as a, this is someone who actually manufactures what they've invented. And it made me extremely proud. And, and I, I sort of realised then, in fact, how unique he was and what he'd achieved. I really believe that if you, if you have a new technology product that's well designed and you make it well, and then you sell it well, you'll succeed whatever the economic circumstances. From then on, it was just, just an extraordinary demonstration of putting back in what you've made to grow. It always felt like this is utterly innovative. This is this is the future, you know, this is 
something creative. Dyson is a company of experimentation. It's just got a soul somehow. Because there's a bit of magic there. We're a company that makes things, but we're a little bit different because of the way we choose the things that we're going to make. It's actually got the potential to shape the future of, of how humans live and, and planet. You know, Dyson's a private company. We're in it for the long term. We do the research and development. We put huge amounts of money into it, and it has a long-term payback. We want to be very, very permanent and grow and get better and better at what we do. We've assembled a really world-class team of researchers and engineers and scientists and located them in all these different places around the world. It's a kind of emotional thing that, that you actually feel when you go there. It's not a predictable path. And that's what makes it that's what makes it interesting. The future has has to incorporate a lot of the thinking of the young generation coming through. It takes a long time to develop new technologies. We've got to continue to be creative, but we have to bring it into how the world is changing all the time. It's not really about making money, that's not what it's about. It's about the difficulties and struggles and battles that you will have the warrior spirit that you need. You know, let's stop grandstanding and talking about things and actually get together and, and solve them. We can do it.